Support for this podcast is provided by the Graduate Tax Program at LMU Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Consistently ranked among the top 10 tax LLM programs nationally by U.S. News & World Report. Tax knowledge is power. No one understands that more than Loyola Law School's tax faculty, who have extensive big accounting, treasury, Supreme Court, and other real-world backgrounds, in addition to their 100-plus years of teaching experience. Using sophisticated case studies and problems, they train students on essential skills such as tax research and how to most effectively communicate complex tax concepts to clients and decision makers. On-the-ground classes are held at Loyola Law School's award-winning Frank Gehry Design Campus in downtown Los Angeles. Remote classes, custom designed for online, are also available. Students take advantage of experiential learning opportunities at such organizations as the IRS Office of the Chief Counsel, the U.S. Attorney Tax Division, and the California Attorney General Business and Tax Division. Learn more about the Graduate Tax Program at Loyola Law School by visiting lls.edu slash taxnotes. That's lls.edu slash taxnotes. Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, Conservation Easements, Part 1. The tax treatment of conservation easements is a divisive subject. This is an issue that's been fought in the courts and heatedly debated at tax conferences and in the pages of tax notes. We understand this is a complicated matter, and in an effort to further the discussion, we're dedicating the next two episodes of Tax Notes Talk to talking to advocates on opposite sides of the issue. Part one features an interview with Robert Ramsey, the executive director of Partnership for Conservation, which goes by the name P4C. It advocates for the use of investment vehicles in conservation easement deals. Next week's episode, Part 2 will feature an interview with Steve Small, one of the authors of the Regulations on Conservation Easements. But before we get to the first interview, I'm joined by Tax Notes legal reporter Kristen Perillo for some background on the issue. Kristen, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Dave. Now, you've been covering the issue of conservation easements in Tax Notes. Can you tell us what they are and how they relate to the tax world? In a conservation easement transaction, a property owner donates a portion of the land to a qualified land trust or governmental entity. The property owner is essentially giving up the right to use or develop the land in order to protect its conservation values. And in exchange for doing that, the property owner can claim a charitable contribution deduction. So what is the controversy behind the issue and who are the players in this? In the last few years, the IRS has focused on syndicated conservation easement, which is where you have a promoter who puts together a group of investors, forms a partnership to buy some land, and then the partnership donates a conservation easement to a land trust. And in a lot of these cases, the partnership claims that the easement is worth many millions of dollars. So they're able to take a huge tax deduction and then split it up among the investors. And in the IRS's view, the promoters have to get inflated appraisals to make the deal worthwhile for the investors. So the IRS has been ramping up its audits of these deals and denying the deductions in their entirety. So it's become quite a controversial issue. On one side, you have the traditional land trust groups and conservationists who say that the syndicated easement promoters are abusing the charitable contribution rules. And then on the other side, you have groups like P4C who say that letting people form a partnership to buy and donate land gives people who may not be able to afford land on their own to participate in conservation efforts. Now, you conducted the interviews with Robert and Steve that we'll be playing this week and next. Can you give us a a brief look at the interview with Robert that we're about to hear? I asked Robert about P4C's opposition to the IRS's enforcement strategy against syndicated easements and legislation that would cap the size of the deduction that they can take. We also talked about an article he wrote for Tax Notes about a dirty dozen myths about syndicated easements which has attracted a couple of letters to the editor. All right, let's go to that interview. Welcome to the podcast, Robert. Well, thanks, Kristen. I'm certainly glad to be here. Before we dive into the questions, can you tell our listeners a little bit about P4C and the work that you do? Sure. The Partnership for Conservation is a nonprofit. We're a 501c6 trade organization, and our membership is representative of a wide swath of people who choose to put land into conservation easements. Um, Everyone from landowners to investors to the land trust and, and promoters as well. And really what we're focused on is ensuring that 
conservation easements remain a viable tool for conservation for all Americans. We're focused on reform and certainly, again, ensuring that this really important tool for conservation remains viable for every American. What is a syndicated partnership and how does it work in the easement context? One of our first start with conservation easement is essentially when a landowner, and that can be an individual or a group of individuals who have come together to own the land, choose to put that land into a conservation easement, meaning they give up certain development rights in perpetuity. And Congress had the good foresight several decades ago to put into the tax code an incentive for people to have this option or really to incent people to choose this over development in certain parcels of land that qualify for the conservation easement. What the IRS has labeled a syndicated conservation easement transaction is that very same thing. But instead of, say, an individual doing it, you have a group of unrelated individuals who come together, who choose to invest in a partnership, who then may choose to donate those rights or that conservation easement. And as a result of partnership law, those deductions then pass through to each of the partners. How would you respond to the critics who say people shouldn't be turning charitable contribution deductions into a profit-making venture? Do you think the tax costs of these deductions are proportional to the amount of land being conserved? So two very separate questions and two good questions, Kristen. The first answer that I have is no. Since the beginning of conservation easements, different advisors, attorneys, accountants, and otherwise have made, quote unquote, a profit from advising or assisting landowners for putting their land into conservation. So I view what what people who work to bring investors together to choose to donate an easement as, as having that same opportunity. The second part of the question, I think, is a little more interesting. The code, section 170H, lays out a great deal of information and, and specifically articulates the types of land that qualify for a conservation easement. It doesn't stipulate that there needs to be an associated cost or a certain threshold for the cost, but just that the land needs to have certain attributes in order to qualify. The challenge that we have in this current circumstance as we look at syndicated conservation easement transactions is that as the IRS reports out to Congress on the activity of syndicated conservation easement transactions, rarely if ever are the total acres of land being shared with the public or with Congress. You know, the other point here is that we're not talking about widgets that are manufactured and they all are identical. Each tract of land has unique qualities, characteristics, unique highest and best use values, uh, which we may talk about later. And so it's awfully hard from the statute as currently written for folks to to judge necessarily um, the value overall to the taxpayer, the, the cost value proposition there. My suggestion would be that it is incredibly valuable to the general public. There are a number of state studies which we've posted on our website that actually go through and look at what the return on investment for the general public has been as it relates to both land conservation and specifically conservation easements. And what you'll see is from state to state to state, a wide disparity in terms of what that return on investment is. But you're talking about multiples of four to one, five to one, 10 or even 12 to one in certain state studies. So so there's an awful lot of value that's being generated to the public trust through conservation easements. Lastly, I'll point out this fact. In the case of conservation easements, the landowner maintains the responsibility and the burden of the cost for maintaining that property. So it doesn't fall to the federal government and thus the taxpayers, as is the case with public lands. So from my perspective, from P4C's perspective, public lands, the acquisition of wonderful tracts of lands to expand state parks or national parks, you know, so on and so forth, is really valuable and important. But conservation easements are really a critical tool to be coupled with that effort. So it's hard to answer your question without, I guess, more specifics. P4C has strongly disagreed with the enforcement approach that the IRS has taken on this issue. Can you explain more what P4C's disagreement is and where it stems from? Obviously, the IRS has decided that they do not like syndicated conservation easement transactions. That doesn't mean that they are illegal, however. What we found is that the IRS from the very top and in other quotes we see from others that are concerned about this issue is that the concern lies very squarely at that valuation point. Are the valuations justifiable? Are they fair? Are they accurate? However, what we see the IRS doing, rather than addressing valuation, rather than issuing guidance 
for conservation easements, which has been requested now for decades. They take a audit and litigate approach. And during the litigation, again, rather than focusing on the valuation question, they attack, we would call, um, term as, as foot faults. We didn't fill out a particular IRS form exactly to the T. We failed to report a number. Rather than allow for substantial compliance and have that corrected, the IRS wants to disallow a conservation easement based on that. Moreover, what the IRS is doing is offering regulation on areas of tax code where they've never offered guidance to taxpayers. So for 40 years now, people have worked, done their best to adhere to the statute in the absence of really great and robust guidance from the IRS. And so today to see regulations being issued that result in sort of a gotcha tactic uh, in tax court is very frustrating to taxpayers, certainly to our members, and I think is a cautionary tale to taxpayers everywhere. If the IRS decides that they don't like what you're doing, regardless of whether it's legal or not, they may choose to come after you in just about any way that they can possibly imagine. We'd love to have the conversation around valuation. If there is a concern from the IRS or Congress that the U.S. government can't afford this, well, that's an entirely different conversation than the one that seems to be taking place right now. If certain people or the IRS or others are not happy with some of the conservation outcomes broadly in the conservation easement community, well, let's address those conservation purposes. You know, this is a statute that though it has been reauthorized and the incentives, those tax deductions that were put in place by Congress to encourage people to choose this have been reauthorized, made permanent, and even enhanced in recent years. The underpinning of the statute is more than 40 years old. And we certainly know that our landscape of our country has changed rather dramatically. So it is rather frustrating from our members' perspective to do a tremendous amount of work, due diligence, again, in the absence of guidance from the IRS, spend lots and lots of money on attorneys to help comply with the law, only to have sort of the rug yanked out from under you after the fact. That's a pretty frustrating circumstance to find oneself in. So it occurred to me while you were talking that there's a similar issue going on in cryptocurrency where the IRS hadn't released any guidance since 2014 and taxpayers were frustrated, representatives were urging IRS and Treasury to put more guidance out there. So finally, this past March, the IRS hosted a forum with stakeholders from the industry all in one room and each side said what they need from the IRS. The IRS didn't really respond much. They just basically listened. But everyone seemed to agree after that this was a really good exercise. So I'm wondering if maybe that's something that can be done for the conservation easement issue. I mean, if that's something that might bring the temperature down and get a dialogue started. Chris, I couldn't agree more that that would be a wonderful idea. And in fact, it's something that we've been asking for for quite some time. I do think that there are real pragmatic solutions to the challenges that have been presented or the issues that have been presented as it relates to valuation. And we would embrace that opportunity and show up to the meeting early and stay late. You recently wrote a piece in Tax Notes about the dirty dozen myths about syndicated partnerships. What are some of those myths and what prompted you to write that piece? Sure. What prompted me to write the article were some of the experiences that our members were were sharing with me, some of the things that I was reading in the press, and some of what we saw or have seen in some of the tax court cases. And so it seemed to me that it was really important to sort of offer that perspective and try to answer some of those, because when one is under an audit, it's a relatively scary endeavor. And an example of one of the myths is a conservation easement must protect significant natural habitat. Well, I've heard from members that actually field agents from the IRS ask the question, your baseline documentation report, which is the report that's a snapshot of what's on the land, the condition of the land at the time of the donation, doesn't indicate that there are any threatened or endangered species. How can there be conservation values? That's not at all what the statute says. So really, it was an attempt to maybe pull the blinders back on some of the conversations that I was hearing and also put forward really a clear delineation on each of those points. And the points range from obviously conservation values, as I mentioned there, that transactions identified by the IRS and listing notice like conservation easements become illegal after the IRS identifies the transactions. We've heard that one. Well, of course, listing doesn't do that. It does require additional disclosure from taxpayers to the IRS. Myth 12, the IRS's attacks are intended only to stop syndicated conservation easements. 
gosh, that may be their intent. But when we look at the tax court cases and even some of the appeals decisions that are being handed down, they're not limited to syndicated conservation easement transactions. In fact, the, one of the cases recently having to do with the proceeds clause, that language came from what had been considered really the standard bearer for easement language. And the IRS's subsequent regulations, again, yanked the rug out from under people's feet. So that's why it was important. Those are some of the examples. I'm certainly happy to talk more about any of those. Your piece ran a couple of weeks ago, and we've gotten some letters to the editor criticizing what you wrote. We'll be running those later this month. Did you expect that criticism? I mean, what would you say to your critics? Of course I did. This is a relatively hot topic in a sort of relatively small area of the tax code, but those people who are practitioners in the space you know, really do fall out on one side or the other of this issue. So of course I expect criticism. And what I say to, to our critics is, and you touched on it earlier, let's bring the temperature down. Let's help the IRS get back to a place to where they're focused on substantial compliance, not technical foot faults, not offering or sort of making up interpretations of the law and then offering regulations before there's ever been any guidance on that particular aspect of the code. Let's have an earnest conversation about the appraisal valuation question and let's work to eliminate those instances of abuse. Now, P for C is not saying that, that there's no abuse. It's the tax code, for God's sake. Every section of the tax code, there's going to be some limited abuse. But let's fix what the critics say the problem is rather than attack an entire class of land ownership. And, and when I say class, what I mean is the one legislative solution that's been put forward basically treats two unrelated individuals or more who choose to own a piece of property together very, very differently if they want to donate a conservation easement than it would an individual or a family, for example. And I don't think that's what Congress intended when they passed the statute so many years ago. There are solutions to this problem, and there are pragmatic solutions that aren't as overreaching. And that's really where I think the focus needs to be. The, both the taxpayer advocate and Judge Holmes in his dissent of the Oak Brook case recently really did encourage or urge the IRS to issue that guidance, including sample deed language. Judge Holmes went further and basically indicated that, that so much of this wouldn't be going on had guidance been issued at any time in the past. So, so I do believe that guidance from the IRS is something that everyone in the conservation easement community is thirsty for. So possibly there's enough common ground there to start that conversation that you suggested, Kristen. Now, you mentioned that legislation. It's Senate Bill 170, and I know there's a companion bill in the House. That would limit the size of the deduction that can be taken by syndicated partnerships. Why does P4C oppose that legislation? Well, what it really does is, in a manner of speaking, limit the potential value that can be claimed for the deduction, regardless of what an appraisal says. So that's a massive sea change from where we are today. If it's about limiting deductions, then A, it needs to apply to everyone. B, there are numerous other ways to approach that in the tax code. A limitation of the deduction based on a certain AGI, for example. So at the end of the day, the two and a half to one was not some magic number that was pulled out of the air. If you do the math based on at least the old income tax rates, what you find is that at a ratio of two and a half to one in a holding period of three years, you have artificially limited the partner's deduction to just about a dollar, a dollar in, a dollar out. And of course, that's not what the value of the donation should be predicated on under the current statute. So we do have you know, a significant problem with that. Moreover, when you look at the landscape or when you look across the United States, now there are no two parcels of land that are identical to each other. And valuations fluctuate wildly depending on economic cycles and where in the country you are. Obviously, in Napa Valley, California, exceedingly high land valuations. Rural South Georgia, they're going to be lower because you're talking about either timberland or agricultural land. So again, if it's about appraisals and valuations, why not take a real serious, real earnest look at how to limit that chance for abuse? Because it's not limited to partnerships. I mean, the partnership, other than having unrelated individuals buy an interest in a partnership, the process for donating the easement is really almost identical. So we're for finding the right reforms, but what's been proposed 
is punitive for only a, one group of landowners. And the truth of the matter is we're not the only people that are opposed to this. The real kicker in the Senate bill that you mentioned is that it changes the tax law retroactively all the way back to 2016. So that's fraught with all sorts of problems with different people in Washington, D.C. and beyond. There are two big court opinions issued recently in conservation easement cases. One was the tax court decision in, I think you mentioned it, Oak Brook Land Holdings, which was a win for the IRS. And then the very next day, the 11th Circuit in the Champions case vacated the tax court decision and handed the partnership a win in that case. What are your takeaways from those cases? Um, well, in the Champions case, it addressed one of the myths that we actually spoke about earlier very directly. The 11th Circuit came back and said, a landscape that has been changed can still be in its relatively natural state. It can still harbor wildlife, plants, so on and so forth. And that was demonstrated in the case. The other part of Champions that we found to be really fascinating was in the factual description issued by the 11th Circuit in their decision. They went on to say, Champions was able to steer corresponding tax benefits to persons who anticipation of that benefit made capital contributions, thus shoring up Champions' financial position. Position. At least from the 11th Circuit's perspective, someone choosing to enter into a partnership with the expectation that they may receive a tax deduction because of a conservation easement is totally fine. And we've certainly heard others argue against that. So at least two really important points we find in Champions. In the Oprah case, again, that case, in my mind, relates to some of the frustration that we have with the IRS. These syndicated conservation easements are abusive because of evaluation or appraisal abuse. And yet here, a deduction is completely disallowed because of a proceeds clause. Language in the proceeds clause was not consistent with the IRS's regulation. Rather than allow the easement to be amended, the deduction is disallowed. Well, Judge Holmes wrote a pretty scathing dissent, again, arguing that his colleagues on the bench got it wrong, and he articulates his reasons why, and also imploring, in essence, the IRS to issue guidance, because that proceeds clause language exists in hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands of easements around the country, and easements donated by individuals, syndicated conservation easement transactions, you know, the like. So in closing, what else do you think the tax community needs to know about syndicated partnerships and conservation easements? Where do you think we go from here? The truth of the matter is this. The environment in our country on the globe is a greater priority than it ever has been for a larger number of humans than it ever has been. In our country today, we still lose hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of acres of land to development each day. The American Farmland Trust, I was interested to see, they recently issued a report about threatened farmland. The number one threat for farmland, at least in the southeast, is low-density residential development. So that land's converted from food-producing farmland to low-density residential development. Conservation easements are used oftentimes to protect working farms and working forests. Climate change is of critical importance. And nature's ability to sequester carbon is insured when land is put into permanent protection, whether that's by a state or federal government or conservation easements. We absolutely understand that people have issues with the way that these are being done. We understand because it's stated time and time again that it, it revolves around valuation and appraisals. And we really do think that there are pragmatic, meaningful solutions to address that issue without, again, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as we like to say. And then finally, if you're an American taxpayer and you have followed the law, but it is a part of the law that the IRS doesn't necessarily like, then I think you should take notice because if they can disallow a deduction based on a technical footfall or, again, based on regulations that are promulgated and having never issued any guidance over a 50-year history, then it's pretty clear that when folks at the IRS latch on to an idea, they're willing to do just about anything to get what they consider to be the win. And that scares me as an American citizen, for sure. Well, thanks for talking with us, Robert. Quite an interesting issue, and I'm sure we will keep hearing more about it. I am sure that you are right, Kristen. And again, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for the questions, and certainly thanks for the conversation. And now, coming attractions. Each week, we highlight new and interesting commentary from our magazines. Joining me now from her home is content and acquisitions manager, Faye McRae. Faye, what will you have for us? Thank you, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Francois Chadwick proposes a framework for developing administrable OECD Pillar 1 rules that promote a consensus solution by addressing the risk of uncertainty for taxpayers. Charlotte Crane questions the rationale supplied in Notice 2020-32, 
which denies deductions for expenditures that taxpayers make out of proceeds from Paycheck Protection Program loans. In Tax Notes State, Martin Eisenstein, Jamie Zoll, and Michael Carey consider two thorny state income tax issues for providers of AI. On the opinions page, Nana Amasarfo looks at how some emergency tax responses to the COVID-19 pandemic could have long-lasting benefits. And now, for a closer look at what's new and noteworthy in our magazines, here is Tax Notes Executive Editor for Commentary, Jasper Smith. Thanks, Faye. I'm here with Larissa Newman with Fenwick & West LLP to discuss her recently published article in Tax Notes International on developments in international tax. Larissa is joining us by phone. Welcome, Larissa. Thank you. So some of our readers may recognize that you contribute to a regular column for Tax Notes International. Can you give us a quick overview of that column and how you got involved? The column has a long history. Jim Fuller has been writing this column every month for over 30 years. A few years ago, Jim invited me to be a co-author. Our column comes out the beginning of each month, and it covers recent U.S. international tax developments, including statutory changes, new regulations, IRS guidance, cases, and rulings. It also covers important foreign tax developments that can affect U.S. multinationals. The idea for the column is that it covers everything that you need to know about what happened in international tax in the previous month. And as we mentioned at the outset, we're excited to hear more about this month's installment. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this month we're covering the IRS's new transfer pricing FAQ guidance, which has some very helpful insights about best practices and common mistakes. Strong transfer pricing documentation can decrease your chance of audit selection. And then even if you are selected, it can speed up the resolution process. So as we discuss in our column, transfer pricing documentation, it should tell a story about the company and about the industry. It should be easy to read and understand. You're not gonna win points with the IRS by making it more complex than is necessary. This month, we also cover the final debt equity 385 regulations, two foreign tax credit process units, one on currency translation and the other on substantiation. And we also cover case law developments, including the government's brief in opposition to Supreme Court review of the Ninth Circuit decision in Altera. In their brief, the government tries to dissuade Ritt by labeling the issue a factual disagreement, which it's not. They assert that Altera conflates the arm's length standard with a comparability analysis. The government asserts that it has not abandoned the arm's length standard and that the cost-sharing regulations implement the statutory commensurate with income provision to produce an arm's length result without the use of comparable. This is a multi-billion dollar issue impacting many companies and could fundamentally change the legal operation of the arm's length standard in all transfer pricing, not just cost-sharing. Well, it sounds like, as usual, there is a lot going on in international tax, and I'm sure our audience is looking forward to reading your analysis in the article. Can you tell us how they can contact you if they want to reach out directly? The best place to find me is our law firm website, which is finwick.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, and my email is l, as in Larissa, l newman, n-e-u-m-a-n-n, at finwick.com. Well, you can read Larissa's article online at taxnotes.com and be sure to subscribe to our Tax Analyst YouTube channel for what's new and noteworthy in tax notes. That's Tax Analyst with an S at the end. Back to you, Dave. You can read all that and a lot more in the pages of Tax Notes Federal, State, and International. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at Tax Stew, that's S T E W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Analyst Inc. does not provide tax advice or tax preparation services. Nothing in the podcast constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice. A full disclaimer is included in the transcript.